Stephen McGee once said, you have the illusion of elections and we, the corporations, we purchase the elected government through lobbying and donations. Keep this in mind as we discuss today the role of lobbyists in not only in the political sphere, but our daily life and what it means to you. My name is Dr. David Waralu. And my name is Dr. Ross Stewart. And you are watching Geopolitics in Conflict. Do you want an even deeper understanding of what's going on in the world around you? There are many things that we can't get into here in these short videos. But on our membership at geopoliticsinconflict.com, we get into some of the deepest and most pressing issues happening in the world around you. There we have deep dive presentations where you can ask questions live, have conversations with us and each other on our private members chat. And we often have surprise bonuses just for you. So if you want an even deeper understanding of what's happening around you, check out our membership at geopoliticsinconflict.com. Our topic today, David, is lobbyists. Would you care to guess how many there are in Washington today? Oh, I'd like to know. 12,000. Wow. What does that break down to for every legislator? Well, if we have to probably seven, nine each, <laughs> <laughs> since there are 535 members and you do the math, basically. Well, it's a really small budget for them, though. It's only $115 billion that the lobbyists control and use to influence our Congress and legislature. Yeah, well, the role of lobbying, I mean, this is a conversation that it can be sort of uh, managed so quickly because the reason why, we have to understand the role of lobbying in the American system. And the reason why we wanted to talk about this today is to highlight that lobbying. This is, by the way, it's not limited just to the uh, American political system. This is around the world. <laughs> yeah, so if you're a citizen of the world, this applies to you. To you as well. Yeah, that was the whole idea. But there is the conversation that is lobbying, or lobby, yeah, is lobbying considered as a form of freedom of speech? Which is a real consideration. Yeah, and that was the same argument that was made back at the beginning of the United States. And the beginning of the United States was the idea of special interest groups. And the argument back then was that, well, if you have only the powerful that have a say, what about those without voice? And this is where the role of uh, special interests that can advocate for the interests of the less uh, uh, well-connected individuals. And that was the arguments of where lobbying was based on. Except things have took, took a different turn altogether. And it's not that some of those those lobbyists don't really support the American people because some do. I mean, they really are looking out for the well-being of the American people. But we have the other side of this coin as well. Well, that was the idea of, of I mean, nowadays we're talking about a different ball game altogether. Oh, yeah. Because here's the thing. And uh, if you happen to be an American watching this, I am sure you have wondered, uh, are there any lobbyists for homelessness? <laughs> You know, most likely not. And the reason being is there is no money in it. Right. But if you look at other industries, you're going to realize how powerful lobbyists are. What about medical? Yeah, that will be one. That will be big tech. That will be agricultural uh, lobbyists for agricultural stuff. That will be pharmaceutical. That is part of it. Uh, defense contractors. You know, all those lobbying. Uh, uh, entities advocate for the interest of whomever hire them. And it's not that this is all one-sided in terms of do the lobbyists actually provide some worthwhile information? Do they have some real economic experts on their staff? And at the same time, do they exclude the best interest of really the entire American yeah. population? So there's, there's a, a bigger balancing act going on here than would first appear. Exactly. Why? Well, because lobbyists are not your average Joe or average Jane. Uh, just for you to know, uh, a <laughs> lobbyist uh, is someone who is very well informed about policies. 
somebody who understands the legislative process, and someone who, some of them have even been former members of Congress, in our case here in the United States. You know, once they've done their job in Congress or not elect, <laughs> re-elected, whatever, what is the next stop is becoming a lobbyist because they have developed relationships exactly, the time, and that works to their benefits in pushing the agenda one direction or another. They also, because they've been involved in the government in some capacity, by and large, mm -hmm. they understand how to make things happen. And some of these people have been a lobbyists for 20 or 30 years. They have a lot of relationships. Exactly. Because here is the bottom line to uh, the purpose of lobbying. It, it all sums up in one word. No. I teach government, so I kind of uh, <laughs> uh, 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 explain it to my students in that setting. And the one word is influence. Clearly. Yeah, because that's the whole objective. Lobbyists are there to influence government policies. Now... Whether it will be to your direction <laughs> or will be to your benefit, that's a subject for another conversation altogether. Because what lobbyists are after, they are after who hire them to begin with. Right. And this is why our regulation here in the United States that if you want to become a lobbyist, you have to be registered. You know, this is why uh, if you lobby for a foreign government or whatever, you have to register uh, with the Justice Department. That's just our process. But we're not here to talk about the administrative process of it. We're here to talk about the how much lobbying uh, uh, has become now uh, uh, sort of a part of the American political system to the point that it's on over the border of corruption, if we may use the term, because we'll use the term for it. And because it became far beyond what is expected of lobbyists. To do. You know, I came across this definition mm -hmm. that might be worth reading out loud. Sure. Bribery is considered effort to buy power. Pay the recipient for an agreed upon outcome. Lobbying is considered an effort to influence power, mostly through contributions. What's the difference? Wow. <laughs> You're absolutely correct. Uh, well, this one takes me back to uh, takes me back to 2009 Supreme Court decision. Oh, that one. Yeah, that decision by which unlimited contributions can be from corporations sins, because corporations yeah. are individuals. Sins. Yeah. So oh. I think, uh, and I am not a a, a law expert. Uh, I have no no. Uh, uh, saying to that, but to me, it just didn't make sense at all. Because you open up this floodgate now for unlimited amount of money, you know, and there are those who argue, and I understand the arguments for those who argue that, well, you can look at lobbying as a form of freedom of speech. Uh, and one may say, how so? One will, uh, will answer, well, if we have freedom of speech in terms of words, we could have freedom of speech in terms of monetary donations. And that was the argument that Saf had made. I watched it as it occurred in 2009, mm -hmm. and I'm going, uh, it took my breath away. Yeah. Well, it's because it becomes the question of, if you happen to be a billionaire, okay? And I happen to be an average citizen, okay? Who do you think will have more influence? Uh, let's try the oligarchs. Let's try the billionaires. Yeah, because that's what it will be. So if we are to say, well, if lobbying is a part of or a form of a freedom of speech, in other words, well, how come my freedom of speech is not expressed? Because I don't have the monetary means by which to express that. And this is to me where the danger is. You know, something you and I have talked about over and over again, mm -hmm. can a legislator economically survive without contributions from lobbyists? Do you want the short answer? Let's, uh, yeah. let's give the short. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> that is the short answer. And it is sad enough to know that that is the norm now in Congress, in our U.S. Congress. And this is why, once again, I'll, I'll bring it up. I am a believer of term limits. Oh, boy. I don't care how great of a legislature you are. You serve a term limit that has to be agreed upon uh, by them, uh, uh, the legislative body, 
you know, with the input from the citizens, whether, for example, members of the House of Representatives will serve, uh, let's say, five terms, because each term is two years, and it's only fair. And this is just a suggestion, you know, five terms for the House of Representatives, and you can do, let's say, two or three max uh, terms for a senator, because the senator term is six years. You don't need to be there for 35 years. Or longer. Or longer. So that was the arguments for uh, uh, why you have the lobbyists managing Congress. And the role of a member of Congress will become what? I got to think about next re-election. And how much of their time is spent pandering to the people who are going to give them donations? Another reasonable question to ask. Yeah. As opposed to taking care of business. Because, yeah. Or take care of the, uh, the interest of your constituents because those are the ones who sent you to Congress to begin with. I think it will be fair to say uh, uh, that uh, some, um, I cannot judge everybody. And who am I to judge? I can't. I'm just saying uh, or speaking out loud here. The idea of members of Congress might have lost touch with reality as far as we're the common man interests are? Uh, I would qualify that as an understatement. You're the psychologist, you will know better. Well, <clears throat> and if you can uh, provide some explanation, Ross, psychologically, yeah. that would be great. From what we can tell, these people seem to live in a bubble, yeah. and they get, into an, they get into group think and group agreement and disregard facts. And we see over and over and over again, really remarkably inappropriate decisions being made that Many people have much better information than Congress seems to have. Do we need to ha how much do we need to explore what the impact of printing over way, 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 way too much money and being in deficit? How many families could survive with heavy, heavy debt? And what does it mean to quality of life? But what we're seeing is high levels of inflation, and what we have is a Congress that doesn't seem, they seem drunk on spending money. Yeah. It's not theirs, so that's it's why it's not they theirs. Spend. So they can do that. Yeah. Well, you look at the example uh, about the debt bar. You look at, like, for example, student loans. I mean, uh, the, <clears throat> the the current generation. That I don't see them how they can get out of that that debt. Even though the government's been mentioning about, well, maybe we can do uh, that, that forgiveness, student loan forgiveness, but that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Yeah, lip service. Lip service, hot that's air, all it is, and so. it, and they say, well, we'll think about it. Well, what does that mean? Yeah. It means. I, t I personally read that as we're going to not take any action on it, and we're going to have these students pay back the loan at a high interest rate because the government can use those billions of dollars to do something else with. Well, can we use the term wasted? Oh, I would certainly use that. <laughs> well, it is because that's how it is. So it becomes the idea of uh, just for you to understand how much lobbying ha can have an impact on your daily life, you know. When we go buy some product somewhere at Target's or Walmart or Home Depot, whatever, some of that, yes, it's supply and demand, we understand all that, but there is also the lobbying part that comes of that. I look at it, for example, in the example of uh, uh, agricultural lobbying. Oh my God. As an example. And have we seen something major happen there? Yeah. If you watch the price of meat go up, there's a reason. There's a reason for it. Because eight major meat processing fact. Uh, companies bought up all the capacity for processing meat. Guess what they're doing? They're putting their hands together and saying, well, how, how much should we charge? You think it's going to be less no. because it's more efficient? No. Absolutely not. Yeah. So you're going to see meat prices increase based on the fact that it's bordering on a monopoly. Exactly. The other example will be, for example, lobbyists for the energy. You know, That's another factor because I'm sure you've been watching the gas prices going up, whatever part of the world you're in. So the lobby is for energy. That's, uh, it's not new. It's been, no, it's not new. And, and even within the government, this is where that lobbying comes in as far as its objective is to influence government uh, policies or government decisions regarding whatever issue they are lobbying for. You know, you and I, we did a show, I can't remember, about, about two months ago, where we broke down how much influence does the average American have on policy and laws in the legislature in Washington, D.C. Do you remember what the number was? No. 
One percent. Oh my God. Ninety-nine percent of the influence was lobbyists, lobbyists. Uh, other government officials who had some stake in it, mm -hmm. and oh darn, what was the third? Sorry. Some whatever. Yeah, yeah. But to, for ninety-nine percent, for ninety-nine yeah. percent of this to be actually in the hands of other than us, we the people, it tells you. Yeah, right. And this is where uh, that becomes that idea of okay, where do you draw the line as far as those who argue? that lobbying can be uh, perceived as a, free, a form of a freedom of speech. Yes, the, to a degree, but when you have money that start controlling the process that lobbyists are using, that becomes a different board game because not all of us are millionaires. <laughs> <laughs> not all of us can have that kind of influence. Right. So and it becomes upon the representatives that we elect somehow to sort of pursue our interest, not theirs, not the lobbyists. This is where the disconnect is. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and something that, that isn't transparent is, what are all the extra benefits that the legislator gets from the lobbyists? I haven't had some firsthand experience with this. Yeah. And without going into details, what I got to see is all sorts of perks that legislators or people in power got for cooperating, that never hit books, special wow. trips, uh, special gifts, wow. on and on and on. And they're really good at covering it. Yeah, because the system allows for that trust. That's how they end up doing this one. But what is the average citizen to do? You know, that his or her interests are put in the back burner because... 1%. Yeah, because that's a... And, and, and this is why the reason why we wanted to talk about lobbying because a lot of Americans do, do not understand the, the political process, how it works for that process to impact policies, which impacts them, impacts you in this case, impacts me, Ross, all of us. You know, this is not about just... Uh, this is us, all of us. Lobbyists, as we said earlier at the beginning, they are very knowledgeable individuals. They understand. They're paid very well, for very one well, thing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, re remarkable amounts of money. They're very well educated. They have great experience. They have great relationships. And they make things happen. They even produce the legislation and hand it to the legislator. Actually, they do contribute to writing the legislator. I'm very aware of that. <laughs> very, very. As a matter of fact, he used to be an individual without naming names here. Uh, uh, a member of the Senate and lost the re-election a couple of years ago and the next day his next job was in Wall Street. <laughs> so, so oh, I'm so surprised. It's, it's, it's sad to see, but hey, more power to him. He can do whatever, but uh, yeah, it, it's just the big picture. The big picture into all this is understanding that how now the, our political process has been truly, truly managed organized, directed by what the lobbyists want. You know? And this is where, again, I find myself looking at the logic of why we need to have term limits. You know, doing a deep dive into what some of these lobbying, lobbying organizations have to offer, they are amazingly sophisticated. Yeah. Like they'll have 20 categories where they, where they say, okay, we've got these 20 categories, we'll make it happen for you, and what it does say, if you pay us enough money. I'm going, wow. I was really impressed with the quality of their staff, the, the deep experience mm -hmm. and expertise that they had in all of these fields, you know, all the way from military to, to agriculture, everything in between in you between. can think of. Yeah, well, you know, the main ones are within the uh, military uh, apparatus, the pharmaceutical, the medical. Am I allowed to say the top two? Yes. Well, here, Facebook is the number one. That's one, yes. Amazon is number two. Wow. Does that tell you? Yeah. And, and, and this is just on an example of the big tech. And then you right. get the medical aspects of it, which is, we all know, the pharmaceutical industry. It's a big industry, billions and billions of dollars. And uh, uh, so we might need to do a specific show on that one elsewhere. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah.
We're gonna do one. You 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 have a lot of knowledge on that, Ross. Oh boy, do so, I ever! Yes, yeah. How about if we do that for our members? Let's do it for our members. Yeah, right. Because they need because we understand. provide really the the specifics of how it operates and how it impacts their lives. Yeah, that would be a good topic. I'm sure they will appreciate uh, that understanding and that knowledge. No. So the big picture of all this is that the idea of uh, lobbying uh, has become. A, it's not has been, it's been, it just now, it's more prevalent, becoming part of the political uh, makeup of the American political system, that is. And as we said earlier at the beginning, the impact is not only here, the impact is also overseas. It's everywhere. Everywhere. So, and that gives you an idea right there about the magnitude and the influence lobbyists have gained over the years. So, so there's a question here. Yeah. And that is... <clears throat> How do these lobbyists serve the best interests of the American people, or do they? And I think what we're inviting our audience to do is take a deep dive into this and take a look at it, because it impacts every part of every day of your life what they're up to. Exactly. And it's only getting more complicated given how. And now you take into consideration the, the, the changes on the global stage, what's taking place. You're going to see the role for lobbying uh, more. They exert more influence beyond what they are. You know, one of the considerations is there are certain lobbying groups that might lead us to a war. And yeah. what would the consequence of that be? Yeah. Let's, Too catastrophic to think about. Let's hope not. Let's hope yeah. not. Anything to add, Ross, before we, we close in here? I think we pretty well touched the surface of, the, of a very important topic that we might do a deeper dive in a little later exactly. on another platform. Exactly. So, Well, we hope you find this information very useful, and we look forward to seeing you next time. As always, guys, stay informed. Till next time. Bye-bye.